Non-ischemic heart disease affects the tissue of the heart itself or the sac around the heart. Symptoms affecting the heart muscle always begin with acute stress of feeling totally overwhelmed. Symptoms affecting the sac around the heart begin with worrying about the heart. Nature makes no mistakes. God does not play dice. Instead, all of creation springs forth according to a few simple, elegant rules. All of creation, including your body. Know these rules and your body comes under your control. Welcome to Mind Over Symptom, where the pattern is revealed. So the prevailing belief is that the heart is a pump. It's subject to mechanical failure. If we could just keep that heart pumping forever and keep oxygenating our blood, we could live forever, right? But if that pump fails, you die. We can have a weak heart, says the prevailing belief system. We can get heart damage, and so on. Some medical practitioners even tell their patients that there are a certain number of heartbeats in a lifetime, like an engine lifetime. If this is true, then if your heart beats faster, you use up your beats sooner. And this is a much more widespread belief than you might think. It's like saying an engine is good for 300,000 kilometers. Similarly, this heart is good for a certain number of beats is based on the idea that the average heartbeat is 68 beats per minute. The average person lives 75 years. So that's about 2.7 billion beats that you've got. Therefore, you should get your heart rate up through exercise, which will cause your resting heart rate to be lower, which will stretch out your life longer by spreading those 2.7 billion beats out over a longer period of time. That's kind of the idea that heart disease and treatment of heart disease is built on that sort of a philosophy. So major heart disease is divided into two categories, ischemic heart disease and non-ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease means a problem with the coronary arteries, the arteries that surround the heart muscles in a crown or corona shape. Ischemic heart disease isn't technically heart disease at all. It's the healing phase of a territorial loss conflict and affects the coronary artery, the brain, and the psyche, but not the heart itself. I go into a lot more detail about ischemic heart disease in episode four of the Mind Over Symptom podcast. This leaves all the real heart symptoms in the category of non-ischemic heart disease. So non-ischemic heart disease is actual heart disease, is what I'm saying. The name given by doctors is cardiomyopathy, which means literally disease of the heart muscle, or just heart failure, which means literally heart not doing what we think it should do. There are several categorizations for cardiomyopathy. When doctors aren't able to discover a specific cause for an individual's cardiomyopathy, it's called primary cardiomyopathy, that is just heart sick. Secondary cardiomyopathy is when there's already some other health problem identified and the heart response. For example, you might get a diagnosis of coronary artery disease, and that leads to symptoms that come from your actual heart muscle. You'll understand why this happens in just a few minutes. And I want you to understand why this happens to give you the power to reverse the problem. So the dominant medical model sees the heart as a mechanical pump. And in this context, it makes no sense that the heart would change behavior for any reason other than a mechanical issue. While coronary artery disease has cholesterol or lipids building up in the arteries, changes to the heart itself make no particular sense. Doctors have noticed that extreme stress can cause heart failure in the case of what doctors have labeled broken heart syndrome. But medically speaking, the cause of non-ischemic heart disease isn't officially understood. Many believe it's genetic, resulting in subtle defects in the formation of the heart before birth, which then somehow accumulate over time. Others believe that non-ischemic heart disease is caused by damage to the heart and to the pericardium because of infections or medical treatments. This is why some people are supposed to take antibiotics before getting treatments that invade the body, treatments like dental work. And as we usually do when we don't know a real cause, we blame lifestyle factors, poor diet, not enough exercise, drinking, doing drugs, especially stimulants, or being pregnant, and so on. In other words, just overworking the heart can seem to cause mechanical damage. This is the conventional view of what the cause of cardiomyopathy might be. The real focus is on what the heart is doing wrong and what technological interventions can be used to make the heart behave normally, at least long enough to get those 2.7 billion beats in. 
So cardiomyopathy is diagnosed when there's a change in function of the heart. The heart muscle still functions, but not as we think it should. Cardiomyopathy or heart failure is diagnosed when there are changes in heart muscle tissue like thickening of tissues, enlargement of chambers, um, change in the tone of the valves. It's diagnosed when the heart doesn't contract in a normal rhythm, such as in tachycardia, bradycardia, flutter, or fibrillation. Rheumatic heart disease or valvular heart disease are when there is scarring or thickening in the valves of the heart, which makes what's called a heart murmur, when the blood swooshes through the valves instead of making a clean sort of bump bump through the various sections of the heart. Pericardial disease is when the sac around the heart, which is called the pericardium, it gets suffused with fluid or it gets inflamed. Congenital heart disease, it's the name given when these symptoms occur before we're born, when the heart is still forming. So then we're born with differences in the way the heart is formed, such as with passageways between the two atria or between the two ventricles, or with the heart backward in the chest, or with only one blood vessel that runs from the lungs to the heart instead of a vena cava to carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs and an aorta to carry freshly oxygenated blood to the heart. We can just have one vessel and it's called an AV canal. Heart failure is often called congestive heart failure because when there are significant problems with the heart and blood circulation, our kidneys compensate by building up fluid pressure by holding excess fluid throughout the body. So there's a major problem with the entire paradigm of cardiomyopathy. And that is that diagnosis of each of these symptoms is based on seeing the heart as nothing but a mechanical pump a pump that wears out over time. This view doesn't allow you many options for keeping your heart healthy, let alone overcoming illness. Your options are basically to take drugs or get surgery to try to compensate for mechanical defects and otherwise just hope for the best. There's also a serious flaw with the idea that the heart is a pump. Although your blood flow is about four to six liters per minute, roughly a gallon per minute, the distance it has to be pumped to get through all your blood vessels is about 90,000 kilometers. Think about the force it takes just to inflate one of those long skinny balloons you use to make balloon animals. A lot of people can't inflate them at all, just because of the amount of force it takes to push a half a liter or so into that skinny balloon. It's much more difficult to push fluid around all your blood vessels. You'd need hundreds, if not thousands, of horsepower to force your blood that distance with pumping action alone. This would require a pump the size of a house, not a little lump of tissue the size of your fist. The truth is, the heart isn't a pump at all. It's actually just a sort of traffic control area, a directional assistant in the particularly busy area of the oxygenation center of your body near your heart, that is your lungs. So the heart is like a grand central railway station. Everything's coordinated through there, but the size of the building isn't for pushing the trains all over the country. It's a big building because there's a lot of traffic flow through this area. So what does push the blood around? What's the actual source of the blood flow? Well, like all energy, including energy in electrical form, energy as lightning, energy embodied into gas, fluid, or even solid form, for example, the way planetary bodies flow through space around the sun, all energy flows in spirals, and your blood also moves in spirals. It flows in accordance with the laws of physics, specifically the laws of fluid dynamics. The blood flow is coming from a higher force than your own little heart. The heart is actually pumped by the blood. This flow happens before you even have a heart. Yes, it happens in the blood vessels before there's a heart when it's just two little tubes. Blood flow happens in little fish hearts, which are virtually nothing more than those two little blood vessels. It happens in little blood vessels in fertilized eggs before the embryo begins to take any shape at all. Blood flow happens in hearts that don't have valves due to damage or birth defect. Blood flow happens in hearts that are backward in the chest, or that have a single tube instead of both an aorta and a vena cava. The flow happens before the heart. And its source, like the flow of rivers, like the flow of solar radiation that provides energy for everything that happens on our beautiful planet, that source is something completely different. This concept is so foreign to the conventional health paradigm that I need to come at it from outside the paradigm. I once met a guru in India, a Hindu man named Ramesh Balsikar. 
As the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faiths, the Abrahamic faiths, are founded upon a single truth that says, Thy will be done, meaning that God's will or intention is behind all that occurs, the Hindu faith holds a similar central truth, Thou art that. Tat Tvamasi Ramesh Balsakar was a student of Advaita, a school of the Hindu philosophy of non-dualism. The teaching is that your true self, your consciousness, is identical with, is the same thing as, the supreme consciousness, or God. Balsikar's subjective experience of non-duality was the realization that you, the physical being, are not the doer. And let me illustrate this with a story, a very old story. In one of the Hindu holy scriptures, Prince Arjuna is freaking out. He's totally overwhelmed with the responsibility that the god Krishna has foisted on him. You see, he has to go fight this epic battle, and if he loses, all that is good and noble and right in the universe is lost. He must win. The problem is, the battle is against his own family. He has to go slaughter his very own people, people who have misunderstood a few things, made things go off on a tangent, but still, they are his loved ones and now he must go annihilate them. So he's really having quite a crisis. Supreme Lord Krishna, the transcendent, the unborn, the beginningless, the source of all that is, sits Arjuna down and says, Look, my beloved strong one, I'm going to remind you of something, something that will bring you great joy. You think this is your problem, your responsibility, but everything that is, intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt and delusion, Forgiveness, truthfulness, self-control and calmness, pleasure and pain, birth, death, fear, fearlessness, non-violence, equanimity, satisfaction, austerity, charity, fame and infamy. Well, they are all created by me alone. And I am both the creator of that which is observed and the observer of that which has been created. I am both the speaker and the listener. I am that. Tat Tvam Masi. Then Krishna temporarily reveals his divine essence to Arjuna just to totally blow Arjuna's mind because Arjuna's ego can't really conceive of the divine essence that underpins reality. So Krishna drops his human form for a moment. Arjuna is promptly blinded by the radiance of a thousand suns, a million divine forms, infinite variety of colors and shapes, all the gods of the natural world, all the living creatures, the entire cosmos turning within Krishna's body, along with an infinite number of faces of the god, infinite mouths, arms, eyes, and stomachs. He sees heavenly jewels, countless weapons, the very source of all wonders, Krishna's face everywhere, all the manifold forms of the universe united as one, the creator seated on a lotus flower, ancient sages, and celestial serpents. Towards the end of the vision, Arjuna sees Krishna consuming the entire universe with his breath, all the worlds being destroyed in the mouth of the god, including all the warriors on the battlefield. Krishna then puts his human body back on and says, Arise, Arjuna, conquer your enemies and enjoy the glory of sovereignty. I have already slain all these warriors. You're just my instrument. Your heart is not the doer. It's not the pumper. It's not the cause of blood flow. The heart muscle is an instrument responding to the dictates of your higher consciousness, mediated through your brain. It's your higher self, your consciousness, that is the doer. Krishna is the doer. Krishna makes your blood flow. Arjuna is your heart muscle. Now, nature, God, Krishna, physics, whatever you want to call it, it follows laws. There's an order to things. If your heart is doing something out of the ordinary, like thickening up or thinning out or getting a fluid build up around itself, there's a reason why the heart is doing this. And that reason is a response to stress. Every symptom, including heart symptoms, is a brain-mediated biological response to stress. How and where it produces a symptom in your body is dependent on the type of stress, that's all. We call this type of symptom-producing stress, we call it a biological conflict. In the case of changes to the tissue of the heart itself, the biological conflict is always a stress related to self-devaluation from feeling totally overwhelmed, or a feeling that your heart just can't do what it's supposed to do. Your heart muscle responds when you find yourself as Arjuna, burdened with an overwhelming responsibility, and you just can't handle it. 
The muscle and valve tissues change in order to literally strengthen your heart muscle in an attempt to make you more able to handle whatever life is throwing at you. In the case of changes to the tissue around the heart, the pericardium and the fluid that can build up between the pericardium and the heart muscle itself, this symptom is caused by a conflict of worrying about your heart. The pericardium changes in order to literally protect your heart from attack and to cushion your heart in a protective layer of fluid. Your heart, specifically the atria, the two upper chambers of your heart, will also respond if you feel that there's a threat to the blood flow, such as a feeling that your blood is too thin or too thick, or that you just don't have a very good heart. Again, this is another variation of Arjuna's fear that he can't properly do the job that Krishna has given him. To get more literal and practical now, the part of the heart that's affected will be determined by the exact details of the stressful experience that you've had. When you notice a heart symptom, such as changes to your heart rhythm, shortness of breath, or a big increase in your fluid retention, this is because you've been extremely stressed out to the point of feeling overwhelmed. This stress occurred sometime within the last 48 hours. After you've resolved your conflict and your heart muscle has healed, which is very quick in the case of the heart, less than 48 hours, your healing crisis will be a brief moment of epileptic seizures of the portion of your heart that was affected by the conflict, accompanied by bradycardia if it's on the right side of the heart, or tachycardia if it's the left side of the heart. Which side of the heart is affected is determined by whether the overwhelmment had to do with mother or child, which will affect your dominant side, or whether the overwhelmment had to do with your partner, which will affect your non-dominant side. Just a side note here, this is backwards of normal. Usually your mother-child side is your non-dominant side, and your partner side is your dominant side. However, when we're little tiny embryos, our two little heart tubes twist around each other. It's to be able to fit in there. And it's also because of the fluid motion, the spiral motion of blood. The heart is just an exaggeration. It, it builds itself around that spiral movement. So the heart is twisted naturally, and the left side of your heart actually belongs to the right side of your body and vice versa. The healing crisis will also produce a corresponding epileptic seizure in the white matter or the cerebral medulla part of your brain in the location corresponding to that part of your heart. In this healing crisis, you may experience a sense of doom. This is a psychological symptom only, not a sign of an actual impending disaster. You get this feeling of doom because the healing crisis, like the original conflict experience, occurs simultaneously in your heart, your brain, and your psyche. A quick mention of a couple other cardiomyopathy symptoms. Pericarditis or pericardial effusion are both the healing phase of having a fear of attack against your heart, almost always brought on by worrying about your heart because you've had some other heart symptom or diagnosis. Atrial fibrillation occurs in the blood vessels leading from the lungs to the top of the heart. This is the healing crisis after feeling overwhelmed that your heart can't do its job properly, feeling that your heart isn't good enough. Again, Almost always a secondary stress experience after having something else happen that makes you worry about your heart. Atrial flutter is a type of colic that takes place inside the atria, the upper chambers of the heart. This lining of the atria is actually digestive tissue and it literally responds when the blood is too rich or not rich enough. Again, it's a problem of feeling that your core function is inadequate. Valve problems usually have to do with chronologically relapsing into worry about your heart until the tissues become scarred. These symptoms don't arise from rheumatic fever, but they can be related to it because rheumatic fever having to do with a very painful or brutal separation often also involves feeling overwhelmed. Ventricular tachycardia and bradycardia actually originate in the coronary arteries and veins and have to do with territorial loss or rejection problems. These symptoms belong to ischemic heart disease, not to cardiomyopathy or heart failure. So what can you do to help break this vicious cycle of feeling overwhelmed and feeling like your heart doesn't work properly? Start with realizing that you are not the doer. Recognize the symptoms of overwhelm, healing from overwhelm, and the healing crisis so you can stop the stress cycle and begin to reverse non-ischemic heart disease right at its source. Your ultimate solution will be to take control of your life so that you don't feel overwhelmed. 
Overwhelmment is a type of self-devaluation, and the self cannot be devalued. It's perfect. Krishna cannot be less than perfect. So overcoming cardiomyopathy means inner work to accept and love yourself and have self-confidence to take charge of your destiny. Now, heart problems can kill your body. I don't want you to get the idea that I'm telling you to go meditate your pericarditis or your myocardial infarctions away, though meditation would certainly not hurt you. When there's a problem with your heart, it's important to seek medical support as you may need surgical repair or help regulating your heartbeat. These technologies can be life-saving. But because our conventional belief is that the heart is this unintelligent mechanical pump that wears out and screws up, not only does the healing crisis cause us stress, but the diagnosis of heart disease can also pose an enormous stress. It can be very overwhelming. So you've got to take charge of yourself from a higher perspective of faith and trust that your body's not doing your life for you. It's responding to a higher consciousness. There are few things that feel as overwhelming as finding out that your heart might give out on you. And our unconscious response to the stress of feeling overwhelmed is to begin a new cycle of strengthening our heart muscle, which will lead to a new healing phase, which will result in a new healing crisis, a new epileptic seizure of the heart muscle, more bradycardia or tachycardia or fibrillation, around and around we go. We start a new biological conflict and a new brain-mediated response to that biological conflict each and every time we have a symptom. This is the cause of chronic heart failure, which in time will result in your death, not because your heart stops pumping blood, but because you have a stroke in the area of your brain that has to keep dealing with your overwhelm again and again and again until it snaps. So your task is to end your overwhelm. That responsibility for running the universe and directing the flow of energy and blood, well, it just doesn't belong to you. You are not the doer. The benefit of letting go and letting God, as the New Agers say, is beyond description. It'll bring you great joy. When you aren't the doer, you have no reason to take guilt or shame for things that are beyond your control. It's not up to you who wins the election, or whether terrorists get into the country, or whether bad things happen to good people. It's not your decision what experiences people have, or whether the sun comes up tomorrow. When you know this, you really get to enjoy the moment, just as promised in the story, Hare Krishna! This has been Episode 7 of the Mind Over Symptom Podcast. I would love to support you further, so please check out my free 6-lesson Mind Over Symptom training, or get personal support to help uncover the experiential source of your symptom by connecting with me at mindtreehealth.net or at any one of my other channels, all of which are listed there. And I also welcome your comments and questions by rating and reviewing the podcast. Your feedback helps me to continue to improve my work. Links to these and other info from the episode are listed in the show notes. I'm Lishwi Springford, a fellow traveler on this amazing journey and your guide for radical self-healing. I look forward to being with you again soon. Until then... Be well and have a great day. I hope you enjoyed Mind Over Symptom. To make sure you don't miss an episode, subscribe now and please share with a loved one. The Mind Over Symptom blog lives at mindtreehealth.net where you can get your free training about the natural laws of healing and you can also get support. I'm Lishwi Springford, your guide for radical self-healing. Mm -hmm.